worked at IBM, I worked at Cision, which is a PR company, and then finally I ended up at Salesforce, and Salesforce had actually been headhunting me for five years, so I finally joined in uh, 2016. That is Natalia Pavic, Industry Solution Leader for Commerce Cloud. I'm Josh Burke, your host of the Salesforce Developer Podcast, and here on the podcast, you'll hear stories and insights from developers for developers. Today, we sit down and talk with Nat about digital trends that she is seeing in B2C and various Salesforce partners that are implementing them. But we start, as we often do with her early years, following up from that quote about how Salesforce had been hunting her for five years. No, it was um, it was for sort of a, I would say, a less ex- experienced sales position. So they were really kind of okay. headhunting me for business development. And at the time, I was an account executive. And I thought like, that's not the position that I want, but I was looking at a way to move from pure sales into something more technical because that's kind of where I started. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted to be a solution engineer. And so it was basically five years of them saying, would you like to be a BDR? And I was like, no, but can I be a solution engineer? And they would say like, Mm -hmm. no, you don't have the experience. And so it was back and forth, back and forth until I said, okay, fine, I'll come (laughs) in as an account executive. And then the moment I landed, I was like, okay, how do I become an SE? So I just moved pretty quickly, 10 months in from account exec to solution engineer. So I could get in front, do demos, uh, build demos and all that jazz. Got it. How would you describe your current job? Maybe I'll describe it how my husband describes it, which is to uh, <laughs> work work in stuff that doesn't exist yet. <laughs> so I went from being a solution engineer, really working on a lot of things. I always tell people there are only two products that I haven't demoed, which is um, MuleSoft and Tableau. But now mm. I have to add Slack to that list, and I think the more <laughs> years that that go on, I'll have to add right. more products to that list. But I've 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 spent some time in the marketing cloud team the retail team, the healthcare team selling platform experience cloud. I spent three years in commerce cloud. And uh, at some point, just because I have, I know like all of our products pretty well, I started working on automotive industry specific solutions. And uh, finally, I joined the go-to-market team. And this is kind of a new position. So Mm -hmm. we're the only go-to-market team at Salesforce that uh, is product focused. All of the other go-to-market teams are industry focused. And we are headed by uh, our SVP, Rob DeSista, who's actually the Gardner analyst that put Salesforce in the quadrant uh, at Gardner for 20 years. Got it. So it's a very exciting team to be on. Nice. Nice. Well, I, I think today we are talking about things that do exist. You had this presentation about you know trends in 2020 and then now 2021, which has been a really interesting time for B2C solutions, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, you're showing this this high correlation of high performing companies and those that were leveraging digital experience. Can can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So, you know, one of the things that I did look into is you know, how much really is possible today. So not so much having one complete out of the box solution, but what are the sort of partners that we can tap in our e- current ecosystem to complement and augment what companies can do today, not just retailers, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. but really any any industry going direct to consumer. Basically, we've done, we really recently released a state of e-commerce report and we found that the pandemic has shifted basically what enterprises are doing. We're losing that in-person experience and we're wanting to move that online. So a lot of high-performing corporations are moving into VR, AR, social. They're moving into contextual commerce. And I thought, well, how neat. We have partners in our ecosystem that can help our customers achieve that next gen transformation. And so Mm -hmm. I, through my work in automotive, I had been in touch with quite a few innovative companies. And I thought, you know, to put that together, I mean, you'd be surprised, you know, Live shopping is, you know, $16 billion industry in China, and it's just sort of starting up here. Right. But that's capabilities that we have out of the box with our ecosystem, which Got is kind it. of fun. And not, maybe not a lot of people know that. <laughs> well, and I'm going to say I'm not even sure I know exactly what live streaming is, but let's put a pin on that because I want to I wanna actually touch on a phrase that you just used. And you say there's a high percentage, like 88% of people who are leveraging what you describe as contextual commerce. What exactly is contextual commerce? So when you go from in-person to online shopping, you lose a lot of the quote unquote context of what you're buying and why. Uh, You're Mm -hmm. moving from a place where you get to experience and discover and be delighted to Mm -hmm. a grid, a grid, (laughs) 
<laughs> where all of the objects are kind of like the same in a square box. Some of the industries that we're seeing moving direct to consumer for the first time are more on the complex side. So we're seeing everything from appliances to furniture to cars to manufacturers selling really specialized gear moving online. And those kinds of things require more information for consumers to make a decision. And so contextual commerce is anything that helps a customer make a decision based on seeing it in VR or having access to a sales associate online so they can kind of bridge, bridge the gap. Okay. Yeah, and even conveniences like curbside pickup and uh, you know pay now or sort of buy now, pay later type of scenarios, anything uh -huh. that facilitates the purchase. Mm -hmm. God. So I think that actually kind of answers my next question slash like something that just came up when I was going through the presentation because as notable examples, it's everything from gaming to like curbside pickup. But what you're saying is that the context we're talking about here is anything that helps replace that lack of an in-store, in-person experience, something that can put that back into the user's hands to successfully do BTC. Yeah, it's like we lost context and now we're gaining it back. Got exactly. It. <laughs> Got it. Now talking very broad terms, how would you describe the Salesforce ecosystem when it comes to these kind of solutions? There's two types of Salesforce partners. There, there are partners that build on the platform and then partners that provide cartridges and plugins into our ecosystem. We have a really, really rich set of partners who are very excited to work with us and whom we are delighted to have. And we're constantly building and adding more partners, more solutions, and really enriching that ecosystem. It's just really fantastic for our customers to have access to that, especially when it's so plug and play, right? Mm -hmm. You kind of install it. I mean, I, and I've been working on some of these demos and, you know, I'm working with some, we have a team of demo engineers who helps us build it. And some of them have never worked in commerce before. And they mm -hmm. literally install these cartridges and like, and stand up the solution in like two days and, and like a really? single person. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's always flabbergasting for me. How they are. Yeah, I mean, that, that almost seems like it would make the demo engineer slightly bored. Ah, uh, yeah, you you think so, right? But I, I think the fun part for them is whenever I throw something new at them, and, and right. you know, it's like they finish with the AR and VR. I'm like, great, now it's time for you to learn how to install live shopping. <laughs> They're like, nice. thanks, Nat. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, well, let's let's talk a little bit about AR and VR company being 3Kit. It looks like a 3D modeling kit with connectors back to Salesforce. What, what kind of solutions is that used for? Yeah. And 3Kit is just one of our partners. You know, we, we have, it sort of depends on the flavor. I would say three of the big ones that we have is 3Kit, Zero Light, and Unity. And I can sort of speak to all three and their differentiation. Okay. Uh, 3Kit is, yeah. So, so think of 3Kit as you have an item and you can render it in your space. So it has AR functionality. It doesn't, you don't need goggles or anything. You can just see it on your phone. You can also turn it. They have this fantastic new furniture application that they launched where the app can actually measure your space and tell you, mm. you know, the couch has certain dimensions to it. And what's great is that all goes back into our product catalog, our data attribute, it's connected. And so it can mm -hmm. say, well, this couch is actually, you know, 61 inches wide or 86 inches wide. It's not going to fit in your space. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to take a look at the following. And, and so they actually have a sizer that they've recently released. Mm -hmm. They're also doing a lot of, I, I think a lot of the, some of the customers they have are golf customers. Being able to really? visualize what that looks like. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like really fascinating. being on the golf course itself? I don't think it's on the golf course, but it's being able to see the golf club. Oh, uh, um, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. And that kind of is all I know about golf. So I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't ask me any more about that. <laughs> I, I went into instantly video game mode where I'm like, wait, <laughs> let me get to play on the golf course? That'd be awesome. You still have to buy something, Joshua. <laughs> uh, that, is the, well, that is the goal. That is the goal. Yeah, yeah. Like they have the configurator and the virtual photographer. And I was wondering what the, what the differences are. Between, like, what are those two things? Yeah. I mean, the virtual photographer is, I think it's really kind of apparel driven is what would it look like on you uh, mm -hmm. and or with different combinations. So if you want to pair this t-shirt with these pants and you want to kind of mix and match, mm -hmm. uh, that would kind of be the ideal for the virtual photographer. Gotcha. Gotcha. And the configurator? The configurator, it's kind of like you, you give it parameters. So let's say you want the chair in red then it's mm -hmm. going to render the color red and you can also see it from all angles, et cetera. Got it. Yeah. I find the furniture one kind of interesting because I always say there's like 
three great things about the internet that Josh predicted wrong. And one was like YouTube, because I didn't think anybody would ever have the bandwidth to like watch videos all day on the internet. How um, dare you make that mistake? <laughs> no, no. Gosh, I was, so I was, behind. I was very young at the time. That's all I can say. <laughs> um, it, it, one was Twitch, because I don't think if you told 23 year old me that he could have just quit his job and kind of played, you know, video games all day for a couple million dollars. Not that I don't think I'd ever be that good, but you know. That sounded crazy. But the third one, while I was working for a furniture company, thinking that people would actually buy furniture online was, I thought, completely insane. And now, huh, now we've gotten to the point. Well, it's just like, and actually, I had actually worked in a furniture store, like in like selling the furniture itself, not on the back end, like I was when I was making this prediction and yeah. building the website to sell the things. And it's just like, I saw so many people being so picky about sitting on every single piece of furniture and then even then, like not buying anything, right? And I'm like, if they're that picky, then how are they going to buy something from, you know, one web page? I, I think a lot of these are not, you're not only buying online. There's a lot of mixed experiences. You might be going in mm -hmm. store, like I've been looking at a couch, you know, mm -hmm. if I can make a confession for about two years. <laughs> and uh, I mean, yeah, it's just ridiculous. I'll go there, I'll sit on it, I'll go home, I'll look at it online. And you kind of go back and forth. So it's not so much just starting online and finishing online. It's right. maybe starting in store and then completing your purchase online when you're ready to get it. Which is kind of interesting because I almost feel like that's the reverse of what we're talking about. What you're actually doing there is removing the context of a salesperson. Like you never have to talk to a salesperson. You never have to go check anything out. You just do it all online in a few clicks. But some, but you also want to give consumers choice. Like we have a lot of partners, for example, Bambuser is a great one that can really uh, help salespeople enter into this digital world. Because something that I hear a lot from customers is, especially in automotive, you know, well, we don't we don't want everything to be online because then our sales reps don't have an opportunity to sell to the customer. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, we don't want to delete the sales reps, there will still be some people who have a lot of questions like me, who do right. need to talk to somebody. And we want to empower the sales reps and, and give them the digital tools to interact with customers online. And so what Bambuser is doing is actually creating a two-way feed, connecting that to your product so they can share the session, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and through commerce, they can order on behalf of the customer. They can walk the customer through the application process. Mm -hmm. You know, they can suggest products and literally send them SKUs so that the customer doesn't have to spend time wondering where that car is or where that item is or if it's the right one. So mm -hmm. we don't want to erase humanity from the process. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just kind of giving everyone more tools to connect digitally. That's yeah. the reality that, we, that we're in right now, right? Got it. Got it. Now, Bambuser also does the the live stream shopping, uh -huh. live shopping. Okay, so walk, walk the old man in me through this. What is this? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so think of it's almost like TikTok where y people can join a live show and they can start commenting. The difference is that it does, it's not dependent on a specific browser. You don't need Zoom, you don't need to go to a webinar. It's actually in site experience. So, it's all out of the box. So, you can turn on live shopping for your brand. On top of that, it's connected to commerce. So you can pre-prepare the products or share the products. The sales, sales associate can share the products that they're highlighting during the live stream. And people can buy while they're looking at the live stream, right? So, you know, I've gone through this, okay, just to make sort of like a personal confession is I recently <laughs> learned that I was doing my hair all wrong and I was watching these TikTok ladies being like, is your hair lifeless? I'm like, yes, is it dry? Yes. You should be using these products and you actually have wavy hair. I wish I could have just bought those products uh -huh. from them, right? I wish I could have just been there, bought those products and said I had to walk to my local pharmacy and figure it out. And right. so Bambuser will allow your brand to just complete, close the loop, go from discovery to in your cart, it's at your doorstep. Now you have beautiful hair. And that's what's already a hundred and sixty billion dollar industry in China. Let me double check that. I'm I'm wondering okay. if I was like Yes, it is 160. I was like, that can't be right. No, and well, so I just, <laughs> but it is. It is. I was like, is it 1.6? Is it one? Is it 160? It's actually 161 billion dollars. Wow. 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 I almost wow. feel like I'm in the wrong line of work right now. You gotta get your Twitch account. You gotta <laughs> partner up with the video game industry. You gotta sell those games online, man. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, now talking about influencers, there's also something called Plaza. Uh -huh. And it kind of like allows influencers to sort of utilize their social in order to kind of have, be their own storefront. Am I even saying that remotely correctly? 
So you are so yeah, and Plaza is a really really exciting company. I think they're run by like fifteen people. Some of these partners, really? I'm shocked at how few employees they have. Yes, wow. and they hail from uh, Barcelona, or as, or as they've corrected me many mul- multiple times, Barcelona. Wait, and what? Yeah, I, I actually did ask this, and this is how what they <laughs> confirmed. And uh, and their logo is this fantastic little uh, symbol that they have in their piat, well, what Italian would call the piazzas, which is what where the word plaza comes from. So it means meeting place. Mm. Yeah, and you know uh, it's funny because we I recently did a, mar- a market sort of research survey. It was like a, totally a guerrilla survey, but what I found was that, and, and I think we did this with the help of one of our interns, but sh- she found that consumers do not find influencers very trustworthy. They are very wary. When somebody recommends a product that they may be sponsored or they might be recommending it because they're paid to do so. Right. And so what's interesting with Plaza is that instead of just purely looking at influencers, there's a fine line between a social influencer who is sponsored to sell a product and an influencer that genuinely loves a product, Uh right? And or maybe a specialist or an expert that isn't an influencer, but is maybe like your hairstylist. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, let's say you were talking to your hairstylist and you just, I don't know why everything in my life is about my hair, Joshua, but, <laughs> but it is. And, and here we are. OK, you're talking to your hairstylist and they say you should really use this shampoo. OK, cool. Where do I get it? How do I buy it? Do I have to pay you what's going on? Right. So or maybe like a naturopath who's like, you should be taking these vitamins. And it's like, uh, which ones? I forgot. Right. So mm-hmm. they what what we provide these specialist experts and trusted influencers with is their own store. They have their own store. And then Plaza calculates rev share and commissions, and they can even have their own special pricing. So they're not just being like, use my coupon code and hopefully you get 20% off. It's like, no, you land on their site and it is already 20% off before you buy it. It's really, really cool. Okay. So first of all, that study is saying that some people don't trust influencers because they mm-hmm. don't know if they're being, that, that like war heartens me, like it warms my heart because that's how I kind of feel about all social media influencers. And I've always been kind of confused as to why they have these like multi-million dollar businesses. And so it kind of sounds like influencer might not even be the right word, but like the closer they are to an expert, they can use that trusted expertise to not just recommend products, but also give insight in those products. Yeah. And I think it has, I think the lack of trust, and I think this is, this is a study where we focused really on Gen Z and, you know, we always talk Mm. about, especially at Salesforce, we always talk about like influencers and affiliate marketing and blah, blah, blah. The reality is the new generation is very aware of these tactics. Mm. They are not blind to them. And so I think ultimately it's almost like you'd almost trust a sales associate more because Mm -hmm. they're clearly a sales associate. They've marked (laughs) themselves as they're honest. They're saying, I'm selling you stuff. Right. right. And so, you know, it doesn't just have to be for an influencer, it certainly can be. But mm-hmm. then we also want to make it for people who genuinely do want to refer a specific product, do like a specific product, and also people who are just experts at what they do. Right. And, and they're doing these shows because they know these products very well. Right. Right. Now, talking a little bit more about products in general, there's things like Obsess, which help create a virtual storefront. What kind of virtual storefront like that looked like? Yeah. So, and I'll send you a link to the Ralph Lauren virtual walkthrough, but think of okay. you're opening up Google Maps. Uh-huh. Uh, since this is a voice medium, I cannot do a demo. <laughs> but imagine you're opening up Google Maps and you can walk down the street, except you're in a store and you can walk down the laneway and down the hallway. Mm-hmm. And you can go in between the aisles and So you're kind of walking through the store and you're also then therefore seeing items on the rack. Right. So you're having that kind of experience Ah, of discovery. Okay. -hmm. Okay. Because I was curious to ask, like, whenever I've seen solutions like this, which have kind of tried to recreate the real world to a certain level of detail, I always try to compare it to the speed of a normal like product catalog, right? Like, Like just being able to search and then go through search results and go to a product as opposed to actually being able to walk down the hall. So, but it sounds like the advantage to this is you're literally browsing and you can see multiple products at once and then like kind of navigate to the one that you're looking for. Yeah. And actually people tend to buy more. Um, They spend more money. Yeah. Because they, and there's different kinds of buyers, right? So Uh you might be the type of buyer that you really only go shopping for something when you need it. There's also buyers that want to be inspired. They want to discover something. And 
they might be walking down the aisle and seeing things that they know are going to fit well on them. And they'll end up actually buying something that they, that they didn't plan to buy. And also, by the way, Obsess is one of our sort of newer partners. So they're still kind of onboarding, but I, there's great promise. They did a demo for me where, I mean, you could do a completely immersive experience. They also could do, a, they could render a sales assistant inside hmm. the experience. Yeah. So it's kind of like, marrying it with the bamboozer functionality. And then on top of that, they can also create any environment. So it doesn't have to be limited to an existing storefront. So they have these imagined storefronts that brands have created these immersive experiences. Nice. Nice. Now, one of the ones that kind of fascinated me was Edie, which I, I don't know, calling it a conversational AI sounds... Like it's, it feels like it's going to be very easy to undersell EV given. Oh yes, <laughs> what I was seeing. So 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 don't oh, slice. So sell EV to me properly. Okay, okay. So you know a lot of experience that people have with bots, and I think the Einstein bot, in, including if I could sort of compare and contrast it to the Einstein bot, I wouldn't say EV isn't the replacement for Einstein. EV is more of a, a way to make Einstein smarter. So Einstein does things like you can go and you can design with the prompts, you get suggestions for what the prompts should be and you create more prompts. But the reality is it's a very kind of click here, click there, et cetera, sort of mm -hmm. experience. The difference with Evie is that she's actively training with every response. So she's mm -hmm. actually has built in machine learning. Okay. Um, and so this is something that you might want to augment with. And she also has access to external systems. So she will be able to check your calendar against it. Let's say you're booking an oil change hmm. and you've, you know, you're a, a dealer and you've connect, you're using EV. So EV has access mm -hmm. to your calendar and booking system through, a, through APIs. EV can also access your calendar if you give that permission. So what she can do is she can automatically find the most common time. So the whole booking process, she can kind of solve that. She can split checks at a restaurant, <laughs> which is, I know, right? I mean, <laughs> she's a rocket scientist, basically. So it's kind of like, I would say, next level conversational AI, like long form uh, and understanding. It. And this kind of leads back to, con to contextual commerce. And because she has open APIs, she can collect payment, right? So mm -hmm. she can kind of connect to, to the e-commerce platform, use your credit card on file. I think that she, something like this is, is, is going to be much more relevant moving forward as people look to move and create this kind of personal concierge experience online. Yeah. One of the ones in the presentation I thought that was kind of impressive was a mom not being sure if a I want to say it was a dress or a jacket was right for her daughter and Evie invited, offered to text a friend of her daughter's, their opinion to see what they thought, <laughs> which, is, <laughs> which is the part where you worry about her becoming sentient. <laughs> I mean, a little bit, because that feels like a very human concept to do. And for, for her to kick that off of a natural, you know, response of something like, I'm not sure if this is right for my daughter. Like if that's real, that's, that's, I won't say scary just yet, but uh, that's, that's, that's fairly impressive. Yeah, no, Evie's, Evie's a great convert and Evie's created by Conversica. I will say it's a great product. And I, I think they're built and they're, you can launch them on the Salesforce platform. So it's really great. Got it. Okay. Well, any current solutions that I am not thinking of right now that you want to give a shout out to? I think I just want to mention Predict Spring. So Predict Spring is a POS system and I'll mention Mad Mobile as well. So I'll do two, I'll do two shout outs. So okay. Predict Spring was, uh, founded by an ex-Googler. Uh, it's actually inspired by the Salesforce architecture. So it's a POS mm -hmm. system that can be designed using point and click. Okay. So think of being able to use Experience Cloud to build your POS look uh -huh. and feel. Got yeah, it. yeah. It's really cool. And um, and that means that you can do all kinds of things like creating financing applications or creating mm. conf joint configurators, and it's connected to CRM. So mm -hmm. the store associates can have access to CRM Hmm. Um, and, and they can, and it also takes cash, which is always important, right? <laughs> so, and then Mad Mobile is great because we, we partnered with them to create a restaurant solution. So, we're what we're doing is you instead of having a physical menu, there's a QR code, you scan it, and instead of it taking you to a PDF, it takes you to an application. 
And you can actually go and place your order in the app, submit it to your cart, and that's how the chef staff gets it. And what's key here is we know post-pandemic, you know, the people haven't really returned to their restaurant jobs. Some of them mm-hmm. have maybe moved out of the city. There are fewer, less talent, fewer people. It's kind of difficult to get service. And so we find that there's going to be a lot, we, we think there's going to be a lot of innovation in re- the restaurant space because there's a lot of room there for improvement, for sure. Got it. I, I will have to say one of the recent innovations we've seen, at least here in Chicago, most of my friends adore, it's the the QR code on the table that you can just point at yeah. and then and then you just get the menu and everything, so they're fine. I will point out my wife hates it because she never has her phone on her. <laughs> That's funny. So, so pie in the sky question for you. Is there stuff on the horizon that hasn't like actually materialized yet that you're interested in? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So I think one of the things that we're seeing is this sort of convergence towards group shopping. I mm. think this might be a next big idea is there's a lot of situations in which you want to ask somebody for advice on what mm-hmm. you're buying. A car is a great example. You never buy a car mm-hmm. on your own. Like mm-hmm. I, I never go in on my own for sure. Mm-hmm. Furniture is another great example. I, you know, I have friends who create <laughs> inspirational boards and then ask me for advice about it. <laughs> I would definitely, even those of us who are artistically inclined, you know, I've even made the odd de- decorating fiasco, you know, purple curtain, as I recall, <laughs> created some drama at home. It'd be great, you know, if you think about kind of merging some of these items together, what if I thought of like, what if amalgamating, you know, obsess with three kit and being able to visualize different variations of your layout if you're decorating and then being able to invite Mm -hmm. a decorator to your session Mm -hmm. and then being able to give you recommendations, sharing the session, being able to add to a wish list, upvoting, downvoting. There's a lot of sort of interest in that. And I I think that that's something that actually we could develop here at Salesforce because I I think it would be a really good place for Slack to play into. Slack is an open platform. It has APIs. We can create in-app messaging. Uh, We can start sharing items like products from commerce. So I think group shopping is going to go the way of gaming. You know, it's, it's very, we're kind of shopping individually, but we might be going multiple uh, MMO, right? Multiplayer online. And that's our show. Now, before we go, I did ask after Nat's favorite non-technical hobby. And like many of our guests, she had trouble picking just one. That is a hard question. (laughs) I have so many uh, hobbies, as you are aware. I don't know where to start. Well, I'm very much into art. My my parents are both painters. So I do Mm -hmm. a lot of, um, yeah, I I make art. I do a lot of uh, reading. I do some writing. Uh, I do a lot of reading, actually. Um, I like running. I mean, the list goes on. I don't know what my favorite, it's so hard to pick a favorite. Maybe I would say like, overall, I I think what drives me is stories. I love consuming Mm. and telling stories. And this is why I'm a big, big into film, big into books, just anything that has a story that touches me. uh, I love it. Yeah. I want to thank Nat for the great conversation and information. And as always, I want to thank you for listening. Now, if you want to learn more about this show, head on over to developer.salesforce.com slash podcast, where you can hear old episodes, see the show notes, and have links to your favorite podcast service. Thanks again, everybody. And I'll talk to you next week.